just really thought about it for a long time because I was at that point where where I was on SSRIs and I was on them for like five plus years, maybe longer. <clears throat> and I was kind of getting to the point where I was like, I don't even know. And I, I had many conversations with the VA and other you know health professionals that were um, in my treatment. And I was like, I don't know where the line is anymore as far as like my emotional state because I'm on these SRIs and they're like kind of muffling uh, my emotions. I had, I had to write this down. So for all of us that do not know, uh, what is SSRI? We don't know. I don't. You're walking over that. I'll, I don't know. I'll, that I'll let the doc explain it. <laughs> okay. I had to write it down because you just walked over. But had yeah, to, sorry. Rewind, guys. Rewind. Rewind. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Thanks. That's a, that's a really good point. So SSRIs are what are known as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and. They're often the go-to medication for somebody who is dealing with um, depression, sometimes anxiety, but typically depression is the, is the main one. And then also for post-traumatic stress, they, they can also be prescribed. It's sort of the, the VA, then many psychiatrists, even outside of the VA, it's the go-to medication because we, we know kind of how they work. They affect the serotonin system, which is you know, just to, it, it's very complicated, but to oversimplify it, it's like the good feelings. Like you have serotonin and dopamine released when you have, along with a bunch of other neurochemicals, when you have like these really good experiences and good feelings, typically they're the ones that are uh, involved. But serotonin is also really important because it is, it's involved in what's called a process that's called neuroplasticity. So basically your brain cells have all these different um, communication pathways with each other. So your brain is interconnected and you've got, you know, neurons talking to neurons and, you know, that, that communication is what gives us our, um, thoughts and experiences and actions and sensory input and all of that. And what serotonin does is it, it creates a state in the brain that allows those, those communication pathways to sort of be rewired. So instead of, you know, neuron A talking to neuron B and they're the only two neurons that have ever talked to each other, you know, in that little arena, all of a sudden now neuron A is like, hey, I can talk to all these other neurons. I want to talk to these people, you know, these, these guys and these guys. And so you have this, this rewiring of the communication pathways in your brain, which for somebody who's struggling with post-traumatic stress, that can be super helpful because you want to repackage the traumatic memories and kind of separate them from that massive stress response. So SSRIs, although they get a bad rap, they can be helpful in that rewiring or repackaging of trauma, but they're only helpful or effective if you're going to actually do the work. So if you're going to go to therapy and try to access those memories and separate them from that massive stress response because without that work they're just kind of you know they're enabling neuroplasticity but they're you're kind of doing the same thing and so the old habits are being reinforced so again just to pers like this is the thing i hate about you know our healthcare system is it's like people are so docs are so overwhelmed they're just like hey here's a bunch of ssris take this many just just go do go get out of here and it's like right. cool i'm gonna do this but like if i don't have any other guidance is it gonna do anything and the answer is probably not you know like you've got to have more with it it you know it isn't just i take these pills and my brain fixes itself like and that's what people ex expect because they don't that's what i was gonna say exactly because that's <laughs> that's kind of where you that's kind of just i say that because that's kind of where i was at in the in the sense that like in the military it was kind of like just give me something that's gonna fix it yeah. like because I don't got time right now I gotta I gotta do this other stuff right. so just give me like vitamin M which was what we call Motrin mm -hmm. um, that's what like we would do we'd be in pain take some Motrin you know I remember having like big old things so you kind of get in that mindset like just give me something that's gonna fix it I'm gonna keep I gotta keep going right. and that's kind of that even when I when I you know admit like took myself as a K man. I don't know what the fuck's going on. I need something. I, I don't know what's going on. And they were like, you know, we, we, we're going to put you on this. 
And I was like, I don't want to be on any meds at all. I do not want to be on like, and I was pretty adamant about that. But I was at the point too. I was like, however, I don't know what's going on. So I'll do what you tell me. But somehow it was important to me to understand that those meds, and I know it's not the same for everyone, but those meds were temporary. That yeah. That's kind of what I, I went into it with. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Uh, an, an example of where uh, meds uh, had to affect like my life. Mm-hmm. Long story short, I got locked up when I separated the military. And they said I had manic episodes with bipolar tendencies. Take this, take this medicine, and they're going to monitor you. And then by the time, you know, we figure out you're good, you go get out, see the VA. I went to the VA psychiatrist. They're like, "Well, this is what they said." I was like, "Do you want to hear my story?" Now, just take these, and just just push me on out the door. And I was like, wow. "I took them initially. Yeah, I had to take them to get out where I was." Sure. Once I'm on my free will, I was just like, no, nah, I'm just smoke weed. I don't really know what these are. Yeah. And when I do take them, I just feel like laissez-faire. But when I take them, it just makes me sit down and don't do anything. Totally. Yeah. It's like you're you're a, a shell of who you were. Exactly. Yeah. Like, sure, you're not, you know, anxious and maybe you're not depressed, but you're not feeling any joy either. It's like this super fucking catatonic state of, you know, like you're just kind of okay with everything but you're never going to you're never going to feel those incredible emotions that are so important for being a, a fucking human which is those peaks of love and joy along with the pain and the pain has to be there to know the high moments too i mean it's all complementary but but like those pills aren't they're just removing the bad and they're preventing you from feeling the good and you as a human being and you're like incredible creativity and your purpose and your passion and all of those things just aren't there anymore you know and the stigma of if you don't take these pills and everybody knows it to prescribe them oh yeah. you just like you're an outcast but right. okay, if you smoke weed okay you're good now you're smoking weed yeah he's not taking these pills so if he's not taking these pills we're not dealing with him right it, i think that's a fair point because in the sense of like, why is it okay, and we could probably go down a rabbit hole on this, but it's, like, cannabis in, in the gen- in general, like, if it's used in the proper way, at least, I mean, of course, if it's not laced with anything else or anything like that, like, if it's just in its pure form, I think that does have some properties that could help with anxiety or what have you. Just like ayahuasca could also have, like, the, the healing properties in, in, the, in the, the brain chemistry level and kind of rewire things in that way, and it's... Mm-hmm. As a, uh, our society and kind of when we can go into as a, um, we can go into the history of how schedule one drugs became schedule one drugs and what have you. Okay. But fast forward with all the research shows. It could help us in, in, in a lot of. Ways. But yet as a society, there's still a, many of us in the sense of they just look at it like, oh, you what? Uh, mm-hmm. Get away from me. Just just totally. go over there. You know what I mean? And it's like, what the fuck? I mean, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, are we looking at the, we're not looking at the individual anymore and trying to help them heal. We're looking at just like what we feel, what we uh, kind of put on them as like what we want them to be. Yeah. And so, I mean, I don't know. That's just me though. Yeah. It's almost like you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Like you're, you're an outcast and you have a stigma if you take prescription meds. But if you say, fuck that. No, I'm going to, I'm going to take my healing into my own hands. And I'm going to most, most people turn to cannabis because it is the most accessible and it is effective. I mean, there are a lot of people who use it for various things and it works and that's the most accessible thing that they, they have. And so right. turn to that. But then it's like, then people are like, Oh, well, you're just the stoner veteran. And it's like, Whoa, like you can't, you just can't win, you know, like right. you meds, you get a stigma. If you're smoking weed, you get a stigma. And there's, and again, like to your point, the, the weed thing is like marijuana, cannabis, even CBD is still like, there's still a stigma there because the whole, this is a whole other episode, but the war on drugs created stereotypes around, around these substances to make people immediately judge someone who takes a psychedelic or smokes weed or, you know, tries to actually use something natural and from the earth to help heal themselves, which has been used in ceremonial settings and, you know, ancient traditions for very long periods of time. And then, you know, 
drugs happened and all of a sudden these things are banned and they're given these bad raps and yet they're very effective and like really good tools for some people. But like, what do you expect people to do when these pills, like I have so many stories of friends who come out and the VA gives them like 10, 15, 20 pills to take a day and each one is counteracting a symptom of the other and they get to this point, like when people commit suicide, the majority of people are on substances. It's either alcohol or a bunch of drugs. Like they're not in their right mind. They're so over medicated or, you know, medicating themselves with the wrong substances like alcohol. And they're not making decisions based out of a rooted, grounded, loving place. Like it's a place of pain and messed up neurochemistry because of what they've, they've got on board in their bodies. And it's like, when you, when you treat people that way, they're, you know, this crisis of suicide, you know, is, is, is a result of, of not having enough tools. But of course, for, for folks who don't, you know, go that route and who are still here, they're going to find a way to help themselves. They're going to try. So let's, let's talk about what these tools might be. And if, if weed and, and cannabis is, is one of those things for a lot of people, then let's make it more accessible and right. people in education. And let's talk about all these other tools too. You know, I think that there's, we're just doing it wrong in so many ways. And so, you know, I commend people who, who, who do find something like you guys, like it's, it's like mountain biking or weed or whatever it is, some, something that's going to help me feel more me, help me feel like I can self-regulate. Like that's critical in order for a person to feel like safe in the world and that they can move forward and really explore their passions or their gifts or whatever it is. Like you got to have certain things met first and you know like there are different ways to do that that work for different people so i'm glad that you guys found stuff that works for you 